if you don't choose to heal from them, you will find that the past story and the past teachings are going to keep revealing themselves in your present. And it's going to be impacting your enjoyment. And it's going to be impacting, you know, how comfortable and safe that you feel with your partners or even with yourself. So many, so many Christians still do not masturbate. Welcome, beautiful beings, to season two of the Cosmic Love Antenna podcast with your host, Harrison Ma. This podcast sets the loving intention of creating the mystical space needed to pull back the layers restricting health, alignment, and love. Now let's walk you home to your cosmic spiritual heart space. I am back here today with a third time returning guest. I think the first first third time returning guest I've had here on the show to talk about all things sex, religion, Christianity, and sensuality. Before we get into that, before we jump into all things, all, all of those beautiful elements tying together, I want to remind you that you're here on Cosmic Love Antenna that is holds and is and holds the intention of pulling back the layers, restricting health, alignment, and love. If you're new to my voice and the beautiful guest who we'll be getting into today, welcome. If you are returning, you're part of the family. I love you very much. Thank you for spending your time with us today. Remember that you can share this episode out into the podcast streets with everything that you gain from this. And remember that you can go over to Apple and Spotify and leave reviews if you get some insights and gems out of this chat today. I want to give the beautiful Heather a bit of an introduction. If you have listened to this show before, you've probably heard one of the episodes we've done uh, prior, I would definitely go back and listen to those. But in case you're new to Heather's voice, Heather is a Christian sexologist. She spends a lot of time in this world helping people not just connect back into their divine sexual and sensual being, but also move through a lot of religious trauma that might have come up in their past that is blocking their beautiful natural creation and sexual energy. And today we're going to talk about the link between the religious and sexual elements, as we always do, but we're going to go a little bit deeper today into all things in the past, the ancestral link, and really what we can do about this. Heather, with all of that, welcome back to the Cosmic Love Antenna. It's so good to be here. I love, I love, this is like my favorite podcast ever. Don't tell anyone else, but yeah. Aww. It's so sweet. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's such an honor that I'm here three times, you know? Yeah, so I I'm excited. I can't not, Heather. Every time we talk about these topics, we we both laugh about it, right? We get so worked up in the best <laughs> yes. in the in the best kind of ways, right? So yes. I can't I can't wait to get into it. So let's Heather, let's just begin and let's just jump straight back straight in. I want to give a just a quick little foundation here. When we last had a chat, this came up, right? This topic of the ancestral link with you know sexuality and and the religious trauma that can come up around it and i want to put this disclaimer out there because i know that sometimes it, things can be taken the wrong way we're not here uh bashing any of the beautiful religious elements i know that heather for example is still a beautiful woman of faith and i have my own spiritual and mystical elements that i adhere to what we are here to have a conversation about is the elements that are layered on top of many of the we're going to be talking about the the christian ideology today but many of the religious uh groups out there that cause a lot of disconnection trauma and pain so anything you want to add to that heather as a beautiful sort of because i know that when people start to listen to these kinds of chats there can be a sort of uh, a disconnect because we're there's a fear that we're sort of pushing these group out the window altogether does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think sometimes too, when a listener hears the word Christian, they can tune out Yeah, <laughs> and they can automatically think, oh, this actually isn't for me. This podcast episode is not for me. So I'm just going to tune out right now. And I do want to encourage you, if that's you and you're starting to tune out, Please be encouraged. While I'm a born again Christian, it doesn't necessarily mean I'll push my faith on any single person. 
Uh, Harrison has his own amazing way of connecting with God and source. And both him and I will never push our ideals. We are here to help the world heal from whatever type of traumas that you might have had, because we all have them in some form or another, whether it's come from religion or whether it's come from cultural stigmas or it's come from generational or society passing down on a belief system that says this is how it is. And so we just want to bring to you the openness and the possibility to you that you can actually believe something different if you want to. And God does give that right to all of us to question some of these belief systems that are put on us. So please stay tuned. Uh, we will help you to feel as, as comfortable as we possibly can. You will feel loved on. And, you know, maybe you might even be a little more open to God as you continue to listen uh, because God is love and we are love and we want you to feel the extension of love. And that is the whole point of us coming together now three times to, you know, help debunk a lot of these things, <laughs> ideals, so that you can feel more and more comfortable with your sexuality, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, I love you, Heather. This is why, this is why you're back on the show, <laughs> my friend. So it's such a, <laughs> and that just like, literally yeah, that wasn't it, planned that intuitively just came through. Yes. Yeah. Right now. So I hope that helps somebody. <laughs> it does. It does. And it sets a, it's such a fabulous foundation. So let's, let's start with this. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to go back to one of the points that Heather just hit on. Even if you are not a practicing Christian, what we are talking about here today, it impacts you just from a statistical percentage, right? Just from a statistical lens. If you if you are alive right now in this incarnation that you are, and let's say that you have never stepped foot in a in a church in a Christian church, despite that, I I would lovingly assert that you still have Christian religious trauma in in you. And that is what we're sort of talking about today, because our in our lines, in our ancestral lines, there it goes back. And this is the first question I'm going to throw to you, my friend. There is there is a long history of of this kind of conversation, and most importantly, this kind of religious trauma in each of our origins, right? Whether we grew up in Europe, whether we grew up in North America, whether we're new to the world in Australia, right? The the colonies, there are there are big ancestral links to to religious path. Just and we're just talking about Christianity here. We're not even talking about all the other religious elements. So I say that just for people to lean in today and to know that okay, if you're not practicing right now, it doesn't mean that this conversation doesn't apply to you. It, it is a high chance it's in that background. So mm -hmm. that's my question to you, Heather. What, how far do you think this goes back? <laughs> Man, I mean, it's possible it goes all the way back into the beginning of creation. You know, I mean, God made us all a uh, human, right? And so no matter what part of the world that you live in or you were born into, um, there's still going to be you know, belief systems that have been passed down. And as you were talking, I started to think about how I'm over here in the United States and our history, like if you go back into the history books, the whole foundation of the United States is built upon Christian beliefs. So as you're speaking you know, even though you might not have grown up in the Christian church or you, you know, had a parent that was a believer that took you to church or a grandmother or whatever, our country, and I don't know how other countries are, I can just speak for the United States, is built, the foundation is built upon Christian belief systems. And, you know, faith and politics have been woven so deep you know, into each other over the years that it's really, really hard to separate, you know, those those belief systems that have been put on us 
And then we're created as laws. So now here we are as abiding citizens and we're having to follow a strict set of rules, strict set of laws, and we can actually get in trouble if we don't adhere to these laws. And a lot of those laws were built upon biblical belief systems. So yes, when you say it's in us, even though you might not have been you know, in a Christian atmosphere growing up, it's still in you, like like you said. And there is going to be some form of trauma from that and and, and a questioning within yourself or like even um like a a feeling of um rebellion, you know, against wanting to believe that because, you know, maybe you have your own set of belief systems and you're like, I don't want to believe that. That's not for me. So now maybe you formed your own set of belief systems and you're living, you know, by those. But, you know, it it does impact our everyday world, how we raise our kids, you know, how we choose employment, how we spend and save our money. All of those belief systems come from, you know, the biblical backgrounds uh, and very, very strict, you know, and, and some of them are not even directly from the Bible. They were made up by man but then the man said they were biblical and of course if you're not reading the bible for yourself then you don't really know if it's true and you can just automatically believe you know when someone says oh this is you know from the bible or whatever so yeah that's the that's a really so two points here is one is the systemic nature of this in every facet of our culture then yes you, you are speaking from a uh united states perspective but you know, it's the same here in Australia. I know spending a bit of time in Europe, there are many other spaces in Europe that hold that same sort of systemic influence of the of the church. I mean, there is a reason that the Vatican is the is I think it's either top three or if not the most successful business in the world in terms of wealth that it's generated, right? It's just because it's 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 every every facet. But what I would say to this is just because it is everywhere doesn't mean you have to succumb to it, right? And what Heather beautifully just outlined, you have a choice. You have a choice inside of you of what you decide is your truth, right? And as soon as we bring conscious awareness to these elements, so everything that Heather just said, if this is new to you, then, and you're probably, as she said at the start, you might be getting triggered in this conversation. I would encourage you today as we go deeper into this, don't turn away from those triggers. Don't push those triggers away. Don't don't numb them. Don't suppress them. Just be here with love, right? That doesn't mean you're taking it on. That doesn't mean you're you're changing your belief system. It just means that you are holding, as one of my mentors calls it, the the tension of the opposites, right? You are now being the observer that is holding two alternative perspectives within your awareness and then from that place you can make a choice right do i want to be in that same reality that i've been living or do i want to do something different right heather how how does this get passed on right and i i definitely have my thoughts on this but i'm wondering how you perceive this how let, let me just give an example let's just say uh, my grandfather grew up in in the church, and mm-hmm. he he became very closed off. We're going to talk about the sexual lens today. There are many angles that we could look at this, but let's just keep it within the sexual. Let's say because of the church, he grew up, and he he sort of withheld himself and didn't was kept himself until marriage, and maybe did some of the practices we've talked about in other episodes. What? How does that get passed on in your perspective to to me, the grandchild? Hmm. I mean, in the in the Christian realm, we we tend to sit around the dinner table and have conversations over food. And so for for us, my grandfather was a missionary, and he was actually a missionary. His whole family, actually, even my mom was over in the Philippines for most of their life. And so he would bring, you know, the good word, you know, he used to call it to as many people as possible. And so a lot of these thought processes we would, you know, hear of 
around Sunday dinner, you know, with the whole family and he would be preaching kind of, you know, around the table and would be sharing his opinions and perspectives, belief systems. And, and he would say, this is what God says. This is what, you know, it, this is what it looks like to be and live out um, a Christian, good, good Christian girl, a good Christian boy and those types of things. And so hearing those things and then, you know, having like a different, like, hmm, well, that doesn't seem like what I want to do. But then I was like, but if God wants me to, and God, you know, says that it's right, and this is the way to get to heaven, and I want to live with him eternally, and all those things, you know, in the afterlife, then I would adhere, you know, to them. So that that's how it looked for us. But now his dad, his dad, and then his dad before, I mean, they were all... <laughs> They all were in the church, like my whole background. It's like my mom, her, her dad, so my mm-hmm. grandfather, and then his dad and his dad and his dad and his dad, all this line of, of preachers. Like, I don't even know how far back it goes, but all of those same belief systems got passed down. You know, this is how it is, son. So then, okay, then the son grows up and then to their son, this is how it is. So, you know, who knows how far back, you know, all of these, these things. I mean, I, that's why I say, I think it can go back as far as like to creation. Cause even when you read the Bible, you know, like Adam and Eve didn't know that they were naked until, you know, they, they um, decided to go against what God said. Then they realized they were naked and they felt that shame. Right. And so then here comes God. And then he didn't, he didn't shame them. They felt the shame themselves. They thought that he would be like so upset you know, that he would like get rid of the relationship with them, but that's not what he did. As a matter of fact, God took the time to knit clothes for them when they realized that they were naked to help them, you know, with the, with the shame now that they realize that. So, you know, God is a God of love and, you know, his principles that he, that he has bringing to us through scripture or through, you know, meeting somebody in a mission field or however you hear about God. Uh, you know, the ideal and the 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 uh, original intent from God is love and anything outside of that is judgment, which then can form resentment, which then can lead a person to not want to be in the church and to completely walk away from God, which we've talked about and and all all of that. So I know it's a long winded answer, but like, I think it can go back so far. Oh, well, and so, it's a- so far. And it's important, Heather, because I have a question that bubbles up just for you personally here, but just to add to this, not only does it go back far like you're alluding to, but even through a sort of scientific lens I can throw in here now, we know that there are studies being done that up to seven, at least seven up to 12 generations, the, the choices that that individual soul made in that lifetime impacts the genetics and the expression of the child seven to 12 generations in front of it, right? So this is even sort of a biological expression. This isn't just foods that we eat and, you know, toxins that we ignore. It's also these belief systems and these emotions and these feelings and perspectives that, that, that tune our internal system that then gets passed on. So I'm interested, Heather, for you now as the woman that you are that's done all this work and you know broken free of certain ancestral chains and and sort of stood in your own power what is it like for you now to go back into those same family settings where you know i haven't asked you about your parents and your background what i assume that they are still in that same belief system and same way of being what how do you notice the dynamic now between your ancestral links with your family that's still alive and your belief system that you hold now and their one that they still have? Well, my mom, when I was a teenager, when she divorced my father, she actually broke away from the church herself. So she, she has kept her faith very, very strong. You know, she's very in tune with Jesus and she prays and her and I pray together on a regular basis over the phone and, so we're very uh, faith, you know, faith based. Um, but when she divorced my father, and he was a very abusive man, 
she was told by the church, yes, leave. But then when she did leave, then all of a sudden those church folks or people, they decided to not be friends with her anymore. And, you know, they kind of disowned her. And so she actually had that as like a form of abuse that she actually went through. And so she has not gone, you know, back to a physical church. She chooses to listen, just like I do now, uh, to people like Joel Osteen, T.D. Jake, Stephen Furtnick, you know, people like that, that have a little more open spirited type of teaching, you know, in the, in the way they present um, the word. My father, uh, he grew up Jewish. And so he was, I think they call it non-Orthodox or something like he never really went to temple. Uh, we just practiced like Hanukkah, you know, growing up. And so he never really like was strict in, in that way. Um, He had some belief systems when we were growing up with my sister and I, where, uh, you know, we couldn't wear a bikini, like we had to cover ourselves up. And so there's a lot of things like that, that, you know, get passed down. So both my parents don't go to like a physical church. I did for a very, very long time. I was very involved, very, very involved. When I, before I got married, I was a part of the children's ministry and then the singles ministry. And then I got married and then my kids were in the children's ministry. And then I was helping in the nursery and uh, I was a part of the women's groups. And then as I got older, I, I got into uh, the worship team and I was singing on stage and like all, all these different things. And I loved it. Like I was a part of it. It felt like a family until I started to have questions around you know, the sex conversation. And so I would bring questions like this to the women's groups, which I think we've talked about this before. And um, the way that they responded made me feel so uncomfortable. And like, it wasn't something that should even be brought to this type of environment. And I used to think, why, why? Like if God created sex and he made it for marriage and it's supposed to be good and beautiful and all that kind of stuff, why can't we have like a beautiful, loving conversation around it, especially if it's within marriage, you know, and they just were not open to it. So that made me start to feel uncomfortable in the church. So I started to get my answers outside of the church. And I wish that I wish it wasn't like that, but that's how it has been. So when pandemic hit and there was no more church physically, I actually took that time by myself with God and really started to dig into the word more and, you know, started to kind of redevelop my own personal, you know, walk with God because I had not gotten away, but I was more relying on what the pastors were saying versus having like my own personal daily walk. And so when they reopened, I was like, you know what, I, I just don't feel comfortable with the kind of churches that I have gone to. They're still very, very legalistic. And I even I've gone to the church that I was going to and I asked them if they they would be open to um, the work that I do, if I could come and actually talk to some of the women's groups or like a marriage retreat. And they they shut me down faster than anything. I was like so sad because people in the church, it, they're like the number one, if not the second on the list of divorce and like the, the main struggles in marriages are sex or money. So why would you not be open to this conversation? It really confuses me. It baffles me that they, they obviously see this happening yet. They're not open to, you know, someone coming in like myself that could actually, you know, help. So, you know, all of that to say, I just listen to TD Jakes and people like that myself and I get what I need. And then I turn around and I give back to my community and to, you know, my family when it's needed. So I think, thank you for answering that, my friend. And I think a big part of that is what we talked about last time is the pastors themselves and the, and the communities within the systems, you know, our belief system is inherently closed, right? But so when someone like you, a beautiful shining light comes in and says, Oh, look at all these alternatives that we can implement here there is a part of them that sort of reacts to that it's like oh this is this is this is uh breaking my tribe or this is this is jeopardizing my belief system that's closed so it's you know we're and you've said this on the other episode and i'll say it here is we, we need love for these people when they do have resistance and they do have fear then 
you know, when we, when we face that fear with more fear, it only puts more separation. So I think a big part of the role here and, and you show a good example of this, Heather, all the time is when that, when that separation comes up and that resistance, okay, I understand it. I give you love and I'll, I'll come back with a different angle, maybe another time when you are more open. Right. But let's, let's, I want to go back. So I'm happy that that is sort of a step that you take, even with the families and your family. What are some tips here? I want to, you know, uh, farm your beautiful mind around this topic within the ancestral lens. And because I'm feeling the listeners that are sort of wanting to know, okay, maybe they have shifted some of their religious beliefs and they've, and they feel empowered with where they are at now, maybe within their sort of sexual the sexual view of their, of their religious practice, they feel more empowered. And now they go spend time with their family, that they go spend time with their family. And maybe their family has the opposite view. They still have the old belief systems. What are maybe one or two tips here that you can share that, that the souls listening can implement with their family, with their ancestral line to help them stay strong in their belief systems, but still love their family yeah. without resistance well i've i've actually had to practice that so yeah. I, have, I feel I it i feel of, it yeah I have, a, I have a couple of tips for sure i mean the the biggest thing i can suggest you know to the listeners is to get so freaking strong in your own belief system <laughs> that you are so empowered and you are so sure of yourself and this new belief system that you have built that when you get around people that you don't think maybe, maybe I am going, maybe I am too much. Maybe I am speaking too much. Maybe, maybe they're right. You know, when we start to question the growth path that we're on, just because someone else is uncomfortable, that's when we actually can find ourselves going backwards. So if your family is strong and and opinionated and very judgmental, you will have to do a lot of extra work to build yourself up so that you have almost like this wall, <laughs> this like or like this bubble around you that cannot be penetrated because you have built yourself up so much that it just kind of goes, Whoop, all right, that's fine. Like it's fine that you say that. I'm still gonna be me whatever that looks like. And I'm going to be me full out with, without like worrying what other people think, caring what other people think and, and not being a people pleaser anymore. Like that just takes a lot of inner healing and work and knowing that even though you don't go with their past belief system, that they still love you. And you can actually know hey, my parents, they still love me. They still accept me. I'm still worthy of their love, even though I don't actually, you know, adhere to their uh, belief system. Do you know what another name is for that beautiful wall that you just talked about? It's called, it's called what? a boundary. It's called a boundary, right? Yeah, it's, it's a boundary. A, <laughs> it's called a, 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 you, the way you defined it was beautiful, my friend. But I would, that's the first thing that came to my mind too. That's the best tip I, I, I would give to add on to this is learning to understand that when we can put up a healthy boundary, my, my favorite definition of a boundary is the distance that the distance between me loving you and me loving myself in a balanced way, right? That's, that's what a boundary is. But a boundary, another thing that we could throw in here is a boundary isn't solid, I think of a boundary like a like a part of our cell membrane, right? That is, it's transparent and things can pass through it, but we decide what is being passed through it. If if it is a day, for example, that maybe I'm tired, maybe I'm maybe I'm stressed, then and I have to go spend time with family. Well, that that boundary is going to probably be more strong that day based off where I'm at versus a day where I, my cup is full of love. And I want to go spend time with that family member. Now that boundary is going to be a bit more open because now I want more things to pass through so I can love that person. So it's, you know, I just want to empower people listening. We have a choice of what we put up and know that your power, you decide, right? You decide yes. what, what you let in and what you don't let in. 
right? Yeah. And it's, you know, sometimes those boundaries mean that you don't go and visit with yes. them yes. or you don't, you know, talk on the phone. <laughs> Yeah. And and sometimes there are periods like that when you are building yourself up stronger where you you can't actually have their influence until you've broken completely free, you know, from those belief systems and you've truly unleashed, you know, the highest version of yourself. I, I had to do that with my mom, <clears throat> excuse me, my mom for a while because, you know, she was my best friend growing up. So like a lot of her opinions and and uh thought you know, uh, on certain things I, I valued, you know, but when I, when I was breaking away from that, <laughs> uh, I had to actually take that time for myself. And so, you know, give yourself permission to take as much time as you need, you know, while you are, are building, you know, yourself up, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Their love is still there and you can come back, you know, to them when, when you're ready. Yeah. Heather, let's, let's talk about sex. Let's 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 talk more about sex here today. We've hit we've hit on it a little bit. I always hear that song. Let's talk about yes, sex, yes. baby. Yes, <laughs> it plays in the background. Um, yeah. We've hit on that a little bit, but let's go further into it now within this ancestral lens. And uh, the first question I want to throw at you within this is: when we think of religious ancestral trauma from a sexual perspective. Mm. Obviously, the f- the females <laughs> along this ancestral past, you know, I'm, and I'm just going to say it, I think have had a worse go at it than the males, right? From a religious perspective, right? There's just been so much suppression of the feminine yes. body in general, not even talking about sex, but definitely from a sexual lens. But my question to you, Heather, and I just want to sort of, sort of farm this from your experience with the, with the couples that you see, is it only a female sexual suppression is there is there male sexual suppression along the religious sort of ancestral trauma route what, and if so what does that look like in your experience uh the short answer is yes it's both <laughs> male and female unfortunately males are taught growing up and this is a stigma to keep everything private and to not mm-hmm. talk about anything and so as a, as a male, you, you tend to suppress things even more on a greater scale. And then it comes out in anger and it comes out in fear and drinking and taking drugs and all these different, you know, things because you have not been given permission to talk. That's why, you know, mental health is on the rise a lot for men, um, you know, because you guys have not been given that permission. So, you know, um, I would like to, give you permission to, to know that it's okay to speak as a man and that your opinion matters. And that as a woman that's married, I I respect your opinion. And I have to share this with all the males that I work with. Uh, I tend to work with couples. So I have a a wife and a husband in front of me at the same time. Uh, And a lot of times the wife is talking, 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 and then the husband just sitting there, you know, and he kind of has a stoic look on his face and, and, and he, you see his eye twitch a little every now and then, or his, or his jaw clench, you know, and I, and I can tell like, you want to say something, you know, so then I'll have to put the wife on hold because wife, you know, we tend to, you know, I mean, we're given permission to talk all the time, you know, in class growing up and, and all that. So I have to stop the woman a lot of times and say, Hey, you know, I, I think your husband really would like to share something. What What is on your heart, sir? You know, like what 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 do you want to share? Like, what is your perspective on what's happening inside your marriage? <laughs> you know, and and give them permission. And you should see Harrison. I get goosebumps when I'm about to say because when I when I watch the husband go from a stoic look on his face to me giving him permission. And then the tears that start to flow and the release, it is incredible to watch because they have never been in a space with another woman that has given them, you know, permission. And so once they have that, it's such a beautiful place. And then the wife is like, wow, I never knew that you, that happened in your, when you were younger, I never knew you struggled Mm -hmm. with that. I never knew you were open to doing this and this and this. In the bedroom, if I had known, we could have done it a long time ago, you know, so it definitely comes up. I, I think for, for men, you guys got a little more work to do on giving yourself permission to talk. Uh, women, we, we tend to be very open, like I said, and yeah, you know, we tend to wear our, 
our feelings and emotions on our sleeve. So a lot of times you can tell what's happening and what we're thinking and what our needs are and, and how you can please us and make us happy, <laughs> you know, as a wife, but there's work on both parts, but I would say the man has it harder for sure. Yeah. So, all right. There's a lot in here and I'm going to try and, and, I, and it's beautiful, Heather, because this is triggering a lot in me that I want to share. So it's, this is wonderful. So the first thing I'm going to say is if you're listening to this, maybe if you're a female, but definitely a man, you're thinking, okay, what is the connection to the sexual piece with what with Heather just said? What is the connection between sexual function and sexual acts between the expression of emotions? Well, definitely go back and listen to our, I think, number two chat where we talked about one of the biggest blocks to sexual function in both men and women, but I, I'll speak from the male perspective. You know, the reason that one of the reasons that we have you know, erectile dysfunction is not just because of the physical things going on, it is because of that that same emotional suppression, right? When we're not saying the thing, we're not we're not letting ourselves release, right? Does that sound familiar in any any other way? So this is a sexual challenge, right? This inability, this 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 perceived inability to release and acknowledge our emotions from the masculine lens is a big challenge, and I'm just gonna add on to what Heather's saying to all the men listening within this, if you are in the religious world, if you have grown up in a religious household with this kind of suppression, I just want to reassure you, the more emotional you are, right? We are not our thoughts and we are not our emotions, but when we do allow these to move, we are being more of ourselves, right? That we are emotional beings. That is part of the reason that we're here to experience all of life and part of life is these beautiful emotions. Heather, my question for you, though, here is coming back to the religious paradigm, what, what are the teachings in your perspective that maybe sort of, uh, what's the word, uh, exacerbate this inability to, to, to feel like we can acknowledge our feelings? What? Uh, is there any teachings within the belief system that you think sort of create this sort of female or male that feels like they cannot express, feels like they cannot talk about these kinds of things, especially maybe in the bedroom? Well, from a religious perspective, we're taught that men should lead, and that includes what happens in the bedroom. So that looks like the position that's chosen. Mm. And if toys are brought in or not, if we were masturbating in front of each other or not, like all of these different things, when we have kids, how many kids? So for, for a woman, <clears throat> religious speaking, for a woman that comes into a marriage, it's hard for us to actually voice what we want in the bedroom because we're taught to not voice, you know, what we want <laughs> in the bedroom. <laughs> we're taught, you know, from a from a practical standpoint, from other Christian women, and our grandmothers, and then even men in the church, men are leaders. What your man says goes. And like, it's it's very like- Taking what, action. What's that, what, yeah, Taking what's that action. word that you use? Um, Is it patriarch or patriarch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat patriarchal, yep. Yeah, so like the whole thing is like passed down. So it's really difficult for women to have their voice. And then for a man, yeah. you know, to, to have receive. his voice. Yeah, well, not only to receive, but even for a man to initiate sex sometimes- um, that could actually be a little bit difficult too, because if you're married, you know, and again, this looks different for every marriage. So this is not just a one answer is going to fit all here, but um, for a man sometimes to initiate, <clears throat> if he's picking up any kind of emotion, that's a negative emotion from his wife, whether, you know, she's feeling insecure about her body or, you know, she's busy with the kids or anything like that. It, and he doesn't want to rock the boat because God made him to be, uh, you know, make his wife happy and to please the wife and don't want to rock the boat. So then a lot of times we get into these sexless, you know, relationships because the female has this wall up and the, the guy doesn't know what what that wall is. And sometimes he can think that it's him or insecurity or it's my body or maybe it's maybe it's because I didn't get it up last time and she doesn't want to deal with me now because what if it happens again? So a lot of these these lack of communication type of talks do come from what we've been taught in the church, you know, to be quiet about the topic of sex 
And so we're very uncomfortable even talking to each other as husband and wife. This needs to change. Like we need to talk about it more. Like you can't over talk this kind of conversation. And also we do need to realize that as the human experience, we do change over the years. So while maybe we, when we first got married, we're only into missionary <laughs> or like doggy style or something, maybe like five, 10 years in, we want to have more adventure. We want to experiment more, but how are we going to know that we're open to adventure if we're not checking in and having these conversations on the regular, you know, and, and sharing if openness has changed. <laughs> Oh, it's so so important, my friend. I'm so I love you so much. This is such a this is such a powerful this is such a powerful chat just for me. And I hope other I hope the listeners out there are getting some little nuggets here. I I think that bubbled up as you're speaking, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't I I don't see this in any sort of religious teachings, unless maybe you look at the sort of Buddhist perspectives. But in most of the Abrahamic religions, I don't see this. Is the idea that if you are a physical male or you are a physical female, you have both divine feminine and divine masculine in each of you, right? So me as a male, physical male, I have a feminine energy and a masculine energy. Heather as the physical female has a feminine energy and a masculine energy. So within that dynamic of the sexual act, we must understand that. So within your example, Heather, yes, the man can lead but there's also a time for the man to receive. Same mm -hmm. with the female. Yes, the female uh, an initially can receive, but mm -hmm. then there is a time for the female to lead, to lead. Mm -hmm. right? And yes, it's okay for that to be the case, right? Does that resonate, Heather? I mean, even men would like their women to initiate <laughs> because, you know, you guys want to feel like you're needed too and that you're wanted and desired too, just like, you know, we do. <laughs> yeah. But when you said about the receiving, what's very, very interesting, I've worked with several males and they said they have a really hard time allowing their wives to give them a blow job because of that. Because they're like, how am I supposed to just lay there and do nothing <laughs> except feel pleasure? Like this just doesn't feel right, you know, for a lot of men. And so to allow yourself, you know, to to actually be on the receiving end. So be a good giver and be a good receiver. That that does take a lot of work. It yeah. really, really does. So <laughs> having a little bit of a domino moment, that's a personal challenge that I have. You know, currently not in a relationship now, but in my past, I was just, I'm just putting a, sh a light on it right now in this moment. That's definitely that specific sort of blowjob element. Whenever I was in a relationship, that was a challenge that I had. And what I would encourage people to do, and this is something that I've started to look at personally, is look at these belief systems, right? Look at these, you know, again, these Christian religious belief systems that are in you, maybe unconscious, and this is the physical manifestation of them, right? Allow yourself the space to ask yourself, what, what teaching, what story in my head is playing that is, is promoting this physical expression? So in this example, not receiving, but then allowing yourself, can I make a different choice here? Is there something else that I could do? Am I, can I be more open, right? I know that that's helped me a lot. Well, when you said female and, and male energy, I just want to touch on one thing, if, if that's all right with you. Because one thing that came up for me, like you, you say the wording feminine and masculine energy, but from a scientific standpoint, male and female have both male and female hormones in them. And so that is where we actually scientific wise, you know, so totally different than religion. If you just look at the science of how our bodies are built, God did intend for us to feel into, you know, all those hormones. And when one or, or any of them are out of whack, one's low, one's high, you go, you go and get the help, you know, you figure out a way to balance out the hormones so that you then can actually tap into the feeling of giving, receiving, and you actually feel more balanced health, health wise too. Like, you know, your mental state, your emotional state, your spiritual state, it just all becomes, you know, it's more beautiful, balanced out way of, uh, of living. Mm. Heather, 
in I think in our first conversation, we talked about you gave the the difference between I think was it sexuality and sensuality. I think you mm. described the difference. <laughs> and and I want to come bring that back in now as a way that we can start to heal our ancestral religious trauma that, you know, again, might be very deep for a lot of us as a way to start moving through it, right? Specifically the sensuality side of things. So I want to pick your brain here. What comes up? So if someone, let's maybe let's use me as an example, right? Let's say that I have a ancestral religious wound around that receiving, around that receiving element. And I want to break free of that story, that belief. And I've understand I've understood by listening to you speak on that beautiful cosmic love antenna podcast that sensuality can be a solution to to this. What would you what would you say to me and how would, how would we start? Yeah, well, for those of you that are listening to this episode and didn't catch the last one, mm-hmm. uh, sexuality, I'll just tell you the difference real quick. So sexuality is more of the act of sex. So the physical, you know, of the intercourse and the act of, you know, giving or receiving oral sex, right? <clears throat> So sensuality is when we are tapping into all five of our senses. So we are actually giving ourselves permission to the feeling of, you know, the sight, like what am I seeing right now? What's in front of me and what can I appreciate from what I'm actually visually seeing? You know, whether it's, you know, you looking at yourself in the mirror, self-loving on yourself or you being with a partner, you know, how can I appreciate what I'm seeing? And then, of course, what you're smelling, you're tasting, you're hearing, you're feeling like all, all, all five of your senses. That is when sensuality, you know, comes into play. And when we're using our senses, we're actually allowing the openness to, you know, the healing. It's when we block what we're feeling, what we're seeing, what we're smelling, when we're not in the moment. That's when we actually block you know, the healing. So sometimes if we're living in the past or we're fearing the future and the future could be you're in the middle of an act with, you know, the someone you love and you're already worried. What if I can't orgasm or what if I can't keep it up? And what if she wants to go longer and I can't keep it up or different things like that? That's also future. Okay. And, you know, you want to be careful because you can, I like to call it future festing. So, you know, there's manifesting right? Which is the now, but you can also future fest something, whether it's good or negative, you know, into your world as well. So, you know, bringing in the sensuality piece and keeping uh, on what's actually happening now, it'll keep you in your body and it will actually, uh, it'll actually show you a lot of times when you're in your body and you're in the middle of an act with somebody, a sexual act, and if you're really in tune, you will actually feel sometimes some of these resistance uh, walls that will come up or these triggers. And you and you can just ask yourself in the moment. You don't even got to really vocalize it to the person, but you can just be like, hmm, I'm feeling this. I'm sensing this. Where is this coming from? Do I need to believe it right now? Can I open myself up to believe something different? Can I open myself up to relax right now? And, and to and to receive and and to and it's okay to feel love and to receive love. I'm worthy of love. Like you can do a lot of this mindset work right there, like mm-hmm. right in the moment, and actually change, you know, how you're feeling about uh, the actual, you know, act or whatever you're doing. You know, and the, and the story that comes up. I yeah, I love that, Heather. That's I think, and you you've shared a lot of profound things on these episodes, but I think that's my new favorite. A uh, little little tip and love act, it. and f- I love future festing as well. I might steal that, my friend. That's, I'll <laughs> quote definitely quote you for that. But I think this is just so profound. I just want people to really hone in on this act because it it is in the present moment that is our reality, right? The future is never set in stone, and and the past is in the past. And if you take a quantum perspective on it the future and the past are always folding into the present anyway, right? So this is this, this is the only, it really is such a cliche thing to say, but it's so true. The present moment is the one that matters. It's the one that we are in and the one that we need to pay attention in. But I want to, that, that uh, act of presencing 
the belief and the story and the thing that comes up in the moment. What I would add to this, and this is probably something you do, my friend, but maybe you're not aware of it, is we can also breathe, right? We can also breathe into that tension, into that story, into that belief. So let's say that within the act and and I'm, I'm receiving a blowjob and this story's coming up and I feel this tension in my groin or this resistance in my sacral area. Well, what we could do is on top of bringing the loving awareness to it is we're going to be breathing anyway, most likely yeah. in the sexual act, right? <laughs> right, so, right? So now let's do conscious, a conscious intentional breath into that area, right? So breathing in and sending it to that space, that resistance. So we open it up, right? And then we can breathe out and we're breathing out that resistance, breathing out that belief, breathing out that story that no longer is serving us. Does that yeah. resonate? Well, the type, the type of breath is, is really where it's at. You actually have to slow down your breathing. You have to slow down your heart rate because, because you could breathe and you're hypoventilating type of breathing when you're tensed up, right? So that kind of breath is not going to serve you. It's it's breathing in for four and holding it at the top and then breathing out and making sure it's leaving your stomach and and uh and then holding it at the bottom. So it's it's that type of breathing that really slows the mind and slows the worry and slows the fear and lets you know that you can be okay, you know, in that moment. And like you're safe. You can actually say, I'm safe. Like I am safe right now to receive safe to be me. Like this feels good. Let's keep this going. (laughs) And I love this topic. And this is like a, this is an extra, if that's not good enough for you, if that, if that isn't enough. And I've, I'm not, I don't think we've talked about this Heather too much, but I'm, I'm getting really on my journey at the moment. I'm looking into all things sort of Tantra and the tantric views of um, sort of orgasms and all that, that breath practice will also increase your sexual energy, right? That's yeah, if, yeah. that that's going to help. The, if you look into a lot of the tantric practices, one of the ways that we can uh, exacerbate and and prolong for from in the male body a, a an orgasm and and you know stop from premature ejaculation is doing that breath yeah. that she did that that exactly. Heather just talked about. So it's it has that extra benefit if that wasn't enough for you, right? Yeah, and even for the female too, if you're struggling oh. with even having an orgasm you know, slowing down your breath and, and, and sending your breath to your groin area and sending it with love and openness, that's going to help you to achieve, you know, an orgasm as well. Oh, love it. Going to be doing some breath work today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Heather, I want to, one more topic here I want to hit on as we sort of come to the conclusion of this chat is again, coming back to the ancestral theme here. And this is when I teach this with clients, this is probably the most important uh, element of ancestral healing that is so empowering. And it's this understanding that when we, when I Harrison or Heather decides to take on a element of our ancestral past. So let's use a religious trauma. Let's say I, whenever I touch myself, I, I I should feel guilty and shameful, right? Let's say that that is the religious trauma that's being passed on. If I, Harrison, or I, Heather, decide to break free of that story, break free of that belief, then I, and I, I call it, we now become the breaker of chains. And what I mean, what I mean by that is we're not just breaking the chains for ourselves, but we're breaking the chains for our ancestral line, right? Our our parents, our grandparents, the the ancestors that have passed away, and we're breaking this and stopping this from being passed on to our children, right? We're stopping it now. Yeah. I'm, one, I'm wondering if you could speak to this, Heather. What does this What does this bring up in you? Yeah, I mean, it's generational curses, and God talks about them in the Bible. He 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 directs it towards other types of generational curses, but they're still sexual generational curses <laughs> that need to be broken, you know? And yeah. And if you're, if you don't choose to heal from them, you will find that the past story and the past teachings is, are going to keep revealing themselves in your present. And it's going to be impacting your enjoyment 
And it's going to be impacting, you know, how comfortable and safe that you feel with your partners or even with yourself. So many, so many Christians still do not masturbate to this very day, you know, and I get into these, some of these clubhouse rooms or some of these spaces and I bring this up and there's anger that comes up and it's, it's this misplaced anger. And I know it's because they wish that they could. They wish that they could touch themselves. They have desires just like everybody else. But it's really until we tackle, you know, how does God actually feel about these certain things that are coming up from our past? So where do we go if we have a question about how God feels? We need to go to the source, the written word. Okay, so go to the source. It's better than going to your friend or your mom or your pastor because they will only give their opinions based upon their experience. If you want to know what the truth is, you seek it out from the truth giver. That's that's God himself that can be fine in the word. And I actually have, I'll give you a verse right here. I, I always keep this near my computer. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's Genesis 2, 25. So that's God's original intent for a healthy sex life is that we are coming to the sexual experience with no guilt and shame. Takes work, but it can be done. And I'm proof, I'm proof of that. It took me all the way till 43. <laughs> so hopefully it doesn't take you that long. You know, I would, I would love to, for you to set yourself free way before your forties, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Oh, I, I know it will happen, Heather, because there are people like you in the world that are showing us what this example looks like, right? And I know that that's one of the things I'm so passionate about too, is uh, this part of my work, this religious element, this ancestral religious element, whenever I talk about it, as we've <laughs> seen today, it just gets me so passionate. And I think a big part of it is that sort of helping not just myself break free from these chains, but helping other people do the same. Um, yeah. I will, well, you 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 actually want people to feel free because you feel free. Yeah. And like I feel free. So that that's the work that God's called us to is now we want others to experience the same freedom that, that we're now experiencing. So we, we want to help you guys to no longer feel bound up in chains and, and to be in bondage, which you are right now, if you have not, you know, chosen to do the work to to release yourself from that. Yeah. And so and this is a good point because I want to add to this. To, if you are in the chains, right? If you are in the bondage, if you are within these beliefs, God, and you know, I define God as love. Lo- that love is unconditional love, and that love, that divinity, that power, it does not judge. So, if it, it does not judge, and it respects free will. So, if you decide for whatever reason, let's say that it's it's not safe for you right now. Let's say you're in a relationship and maybe you're with a, a partner, God forbid, that's abusive. Let's say it's right now in this moment, it is not safe for you to break free of these chains. I also want you to feel that there's no judgment for that. There's no judgment. And this is why Heather just said, these opportunities come back around, right? They come back around because there is no judgment. There, are, The universe is abundant, right? And if you you deserve to break free of these chains, but even if for whatever reason you decide not to, you are not judged for that, and you will be given another beautiful opportunity to step in to step into that power if you decide. Right? Yeah, it comes up. Yeah, because that that God wants you to feel it, man. He wants you to feel like oh, uh, it's it just feels so good. And I was given many opportunities over the years, and I ignored them for a long time because I thought that God wouldn't approve of you know, me. So it took a long time for me to let go. And uh, I actually have worked with women in well into their 60s and 70s that have been able to release themselves within that time frame of their age. So it's never too late to, to allow this work to, you know, bring you the sense of freedom to be yourself, you yeah. know, and confidence and all that in the bedroom. And I'll even go more spiritual and woo woo here. This is also what multiple lives are for right we have different incarnations one this is one of the reasons right if we if there is a lesson that needs to be learned and we even don't even so beyond the 80 and 90 year old even if we still don't get it your soul is going to come back right and and that's why these ancestral wounds are there right they're there to give us multiple opportunities 
to be that beautiful breaker of chains, right? That we mm-hmm. we deserve to be. And if it's not uh, incarnation, it could be the passing down. That's why possibly yeah. it's seen so long yeah. in the generations because you know the the next generation hasn't learned that lesson yet. So yeah. now we give the the next generation the opportunity. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, down the mother line or the father line. Yeah. Yeah. Heather, I love you very much. Thank you for. I think I've said that three times. So I think that's the. Yeah. This is this is the I most love. Harrison, Harrison loves Heather. <laughs> yeah, this is. We're going to keep a tally. We're going to keep a love you tally. Um, <laughs> Heather, as always, I want to before we finish now, I want to give you opportunity to really speak about what you're doing in the world for people that mm-hmm. have listened to you and have been on this, sh- have listened to you on the show, and they're pulled to your heart and your energy. What do you have going on in your world? I know you have a book. Yes. Oh my God. Well, actually, it's going to be published on August the 8th, and it's actually called Why Doesn't My Husband Want Me? And it's a beautiful, beautiful real-life story about my my own marriage and how we overcame 12 years of sexlessness and how we did that. And I really want you know to bring a voice to sexlessness because so many of us are stuck in that and we have no one to talk to and no change is happening. So I wanted to help you guys with that. So that will be available on Amazon on August the 8th uh, for purchase. Uh, I also now am booking speaking gigs. So I'm super excited about that. And I'm looking to speak at singles retreats, premarital retreats or counseling sessions, marriage retreats, different types of, of retreats. Uh, within small groups or big, you know, churches where I can actually help to bring a conversation like this one uh, to help destigmatize the sex conversation so that, you know, couples can be helped more in their marriage to bring more of that emotional intimacy back and keep the connection strong and not allow the enemy to have a foothold uh, in the marriage. So if you hear or know of, please reach out to me on Instagram sex coach Heather and I would love 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 to be a part of your next event beautiful as always wonderful listeners if you want to connect in with Heather too I'll put all the her details all the details the links the book the connection to speaking in the show notes so just click on the details of the podcast and you'll you'll see the links to there Heather thank you for spending time with me today I'm going to say it one more time. I love you very much. I appreciate the I work. Love you that, too. <laughs> I, I appreciate the work that you're doing in the world. And I'm sure we'll do another episode very soon. Beautiful listeners out there in the listening world. Thank you for giving us your ears, your heart, your attention. If this episode brought you some love, please share it with someone that you love very much. But until next time here on the Cosmic Love Antenna, we wish you a wonderful evening, morning and night. And we'll talk again very soon. Bye, everyone. Before I leave you today, beautiful beings, I'm so excited to share a special announcement just with you. On the 20th to the 23rd of April, 2023, I and a fellow guest of the show, the beautiful Ali Paws, will be hosting live in Tulum, Mexico, the Cosmic Heart Tour. If you listen to this podcast week to week and you resonate with my frequency, with my voice, with my love in any of the topics I share with you, then most likely it is time for us to connect and heal in person. So I invite you to join us in Mexico. Join us for some meditations, activations, yoga, cranial sacral therapy, a book release, a live Q&A, poetry, and so much more. These spots are going to fill up super quick because our intention is to make this exclusive and intimate. So please DM me Cosmic Heart Tour on any of my social channels. That's Cosmic Heart Tour on any of my social channels, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, and we'll book in a meeting so you can join the love. I'm so excited to connect with you in the flesh. Thank you for listening to the Cosmic Love Antenna with me, your host, Harrison. If you gain value or this episode hit your heart, please remember to share this out with a friend, a family member, or a lover. You can also leave your love over on Apple Reviews and Spotify star feedback, and this helps me spread my frequency to more souls in need. Finally, if you want to connect with me deeper, want to reach out, interested in coaching, please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn at Harrison Ma, Ma spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R. Sending you so much love.